Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Our panel is joining us, and we warmly welcome you here to the JFK Junior Forum for a most timely discussion on the coronavirus. I would direct our students and faculty and staff colleagues to a recent uh, note from the university in terms of various protocol procedures, in terms of travel, both uh, business travel for the university and personal travel, both international and domestic. There's an update and guidance that was recently uh, sent out, including returning to campus and various protocols uh, that are recommended and off-campus meetings, including a recommendation to discourage non-essential meetings of, uh, of a large scale, over 100 people. So obviously this has implications for the forum that will be thinking through. Long-time forum guests will note our intention in uh, separating the seats a bit with the uh, desired uh, social distancing and the, the kind of protocols. We observe, uh, once again, the recommendations that have been given in terms of proper and necessary hygiene and coughing into your uh, arm, the various Purell uh, the dispensers that are here, everything that we can and should be doing. Uh, our students, faculty, and staff, we've received notices, but once again, uh, a reminder in the context, certainly, of this important discussion. So we, uh, will, I, we urge all of you to stay alert to the Institute of Politics as we think through the implications for the forums, for those guests that may not be traveling, for the convenings of the size that may not be possible. So given that this just has been forwarded to us within the, within the hour, uh, stay mindful of our, of our website and announcements as we address each and every forum as appropriate. I'm sure you can appreciate that. But all the more reason uh, the importance of this afternoon's conversation. And we are deeply grateful to our colleagues that have joined us on the panel uh, that I will introduce briefly. The program has their more complete bio, and I will not rehearse that or take time away for the discussion that I think we would all get into. But let me begin with our moderator, Rick Burke, who is the co-founder and the executive editor of STAT, which is a Boston-based national online effort focusing on health and medicine. He is a longtime journalist with the New York Times, having covered the White House and Congress, uh, important beats. He is a valued and important member of our senior advisory committee here at the Institute of Politics, and he is well-placed to, to moderate today's conversation. Professor Julia Kayyem has spent over 15 years uh, managing complex policy initiatives uh, in government and major crises at both the state and the national level. She serves as the faculty chair of the Homeland Security Program here at the Kennedy School. And during the Obama administration, served as assistant secretary for intergovernmental affairs in the Department of Homeland Security. Helen Branswell is a senior a writer covering infectious disease at STAT, and her career has uh, spanned important years coverage of infectious disease during Toronto's SARS outbreak in 2003 um, and beyond. So she brings uh, considerable experience on her reporting, uh, and in 2010, she was a Neiman Global Health Fellow here at Harvard. So we Welcome you back in this. And finally, Dr. Michael Mina, who is Assistant Professor of Epidemiology at Harvard's Chan School of Public Health. He specializes in immunology and infectious diseases, and his research focuses on understanding uh, the life history of infectious, infectious uh, pathogens uh, across ages and genders and demographics and geography. So we could not have a more relevant or uh, expert uh, panel to have be in conversation with our great moderator. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Rick. Thank you, Mark. And thanks, everyone, for coming. And thank our, our, our panel, um, who's, as Mark said, really well suited for this discussion. Um, I, my first question is an obvious one. Are we, I mean, we all came here, all <laughs> of us today. Is this a mistake, Michael? <laughs> Should we not be here? <laughs> Thank you. 
Do I think that this is a bad idea? I think we're hitting the time uh, in the course of this epidemic where um, th we might consider that this be one of the last uh, types of events like this that we should be really promoting or pushing forth. Um, we were supposed to, there's an event in Wellesley, Mass, tomorrow that I was supposed to be speaking at and uh, just, just uh, today there was somebody uh, has been uh, diagnosed there and so um, we're canceling that event and I think across the country we should be considering canceling most major events and classes will be a, it's a lot of complicated um, tasks to do these things but yeah. But uh, I understand that but Julia, how mm -hmm. do you balance sort of alarmism versus practical advice for people like well, I, I just, you know, get your head around that this is the practical. I mean, in other words, um, I often say, you know, there's a space between tune out and freak out, and that's planning. And we've had a period of time. Um, I don't want to look back at the government, but, you know, us personally, this is not the first time you're hearing about the virus. And um, the challenge that we have is, unlike a crisis like a hurricane or a terror attack, that's sort of a boom moment that everyone can galvanize and motivate around. We have, you know, sort of a slow roll crisis coming from China to the West over here to the East. So just, you know, just the ba get your head around it. It's here. There are going to be massive disruptions to our social fabric in the terms of your day to day. Um, all of you have a part in um, stopping uh, the spread of this. You, everyone can be a hero, as I say, if you wanted to be one. Uh, but we have to treat this as part of the plan. And so I think, and we're at that stage now. So um, the challenge as I was saying, is you said we don't have the boom moment. So for employers, a university, this guidance just came out 20 minutes ago. We decided to go forward um, uh, mostly because it pro might be the uh, uh, last form, but also, um, you know, when do you activate? That's the sort of challenge right now. And what I want everyone to hear is you activate the the activation will come suddenly, as we've just discovered 20 minutes ago. Um, and then you will change, right? Life will change. Your kids will be home. You'll be working from home. That is going to happen to us in the next two weeks, just period. I don't, I mean, just get your head, whatever the president, just get your head around it um, and plan for it. Um, and then things seem less disruptive. Um, I don't know what it means to panic. I don't know if it's not in my gene pool or what. I, I just... Like, it is what it is, and let's just get our head around it. And then the good news is, is that what we, the data, and be curious what we see from China is, it, it's not the end. Like, on the other side of this, we will then regroup, and we will um, uh, hopefully have lost fewer people because of the great work that people like you are doing, um, and then we move on. Let, let me ask you, uh, Helen, how you balance it with your reporting. I see you every day rigorously, yeah. like, talking to the right people, being very careful with the information you put out. And some of your stories are very concerning, obviously. Do you ever feel like, am I going too far? How do you balance it with your editor? Mm. Well, first of all, I have the best editor in the world. <laughs> um, and working with him is just like... Hey, Not me, but... Yeah, somebody, <laughs> somebody he hired. <laughs> and we work like this together. Um, you know, I, I don't, I've been asked this before and I don't really look at it through that frame, I have to say. I, I'm trying to find out what the most important things people need to know are. And I'm not sort of then thinking, oh, is this going to panic people? Yeah. I, I, I just, I think that isn't a useful way to approach it. I think people need to know what this is and I'm trying to find out what it is, and I'm trying to tell them that. And speaking of that, you, you had a story today with a lot of the answered questions, a lot of the unanswered questions, but in the end, there was a real um, one that got my attention. Your final <coughs> um, headline was, and the piece was, the, the big question is, how deadly is this outbreak? The mm -hmm. big unknown. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little about that? Michael would probably be better for that, but I can start. Uh, you know, it's the data, f when an outbreak starts, it's just chaos, and you can't really know what you're dealing with immediately. People have accused China of hiding numbers, and I don't know if they have or they haven't. I think that probably 
hasn't been true, at least laterally. Um, but, you know, when you're looking for people who have pneumonia, you're not counting people who don't have pneumonia. So you don't capture all of the people who are at home with a cold. The huge hope here is that there are people in China who have just not risen to the level of <coughs> pinging the system's attention so that, you know, the denominator of this outbreak is something much bigger than it looks like now. If that's the case, then the case fatality ratio of this will look less daunting than it currently looks. It currently looks really bad, but it has a long way to go before it looks good. And, you know, I, I'm constantly um, getting these emails telling me, you know, you should be focusing on flu. Flu is really dangerous. And it's like, flu is really dangerous. This is also really dangerous and more dangerous. And um, we need to take it seriously. Yeah. Michael, what would you say? How daunting is it in your view? I think um, it's, it's the most daunting virus that we've contended with in half a century or more. Um, and it is, I, I completely agree with what Helen's saying that the, we, we really don't know the denominator and until we get a better understanding of that, it's, it's hard to take, a, take an approach where we say that the mortality rate um, per cases is 1% or 2% and then apply that same logic to infection mortality rate, which is a very, very different number. My personal feeling epidemiologically in the way that this has spread is there's a, a very good chance that there's at least 10 times more people in China who have been exposed, um, whether you want to call it infected or just acquired the virus and, and had a sort of asymptomatic clearance. But if that's the case, if you have a huge number of people who, are, who have been exposed, then it, um, on the one hand, it makes it harder to control overall, but it also is really uh, the, the silver lining there is that the, it really drops mortality to numbers that I've we are not comfortable with in particular, uh, but, but numbers that we are a little bit more comfortable with, 0.5%, 0.1%, less than that. Um, the difference is that unlike seasonal flu, so even, a, even in the case that, let's say, the mortality rate was the same as seasonal flu, and there's been a lot of comparisons against, uh, against seasonal influenza, the difference is we have an entirely susceptible population. Yeah. And so the potential for this to burn through a population very quickly is very high without extraordinary measures, um, which right. our population here is not particularly accustomed to, to being uncomfortable. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of countries in the world are more resilient in the face of problems than, than a lot of places like the, yeah. the US. <laughs> Jul Juliet, your, your expertise is in resiliency yeah. planning. Uh, how, how ready are we for this? We've had the debacle with the testing yes. and, the, and, and, and cuts at the CDC and yeah. other places. So, okay, so uh, let me uh, do sort of three different phases of this. So, okay, we uh, are, this is coming at a time when it's not just sort of significant changes or uh, funding cuts to the CDC and all the stuff that you've heard sort of politically about, you know, the Homeland Security staff being demoted within the National Security Council, the pandemic planning office being disbanded. So you have, so you have one set of issues, which is just sort of bureaucratically, um, uh, we weren't ready. It took a while to get a czar. You know, now we have a czar who's the vice president. Um, and so just as a management leadership thing, that was, I don't like that. I, I like people who are sort of charged with a mission. That helps with an incident command. Um, the second is obviously um, leadership. And I, you know, I'm not, I, you know, we have the president we have, not the president we need. So just get your head around it, right? So false information, uh, minimizing um, uh, uh, what the harm is, giving bad advice about what we're supposed to do. You could spend all of your energy on that, and if I can give you any Zen moment in this time, it is please move on. Uh, the, there won't be changes. Um, the good news is, is that most of this stuff is, is actually executed by people who are sitting next to me and others on the local level. That gives me hope. Um, and I actually think on the local and state um, uh, issue in terms of identification, we are starting to see more reliable numbers. Yes, he's nodding. Good. Um, uh, the third, uh, um, the third uh, issue um, is, of course, 
um, uh, this disruption to society um, and how ready we are. Uh, it is a very hard thing to communicate, um, and I recognize that, and I've been trying to communicate it through mechanisms I have over the last six weeks. We knew this moment was coming. Um, and this moment, call it phase two, call it activation. There are, you know, last week was, oh my God, it's here, right? So we knew that was coming, containment. It didn't fail, it was delayed, um, or it gave us some time. Um, so the massive disruptions are gonna occur over the next two to three weeks. We're starting to feel them now. Um, and those will not be consistent. You know, in other words, some school districts will close, others will not, some universities will do this, and you'll wonder why, and maybe, uh, as I, you know, there's just no right answer. We're just trying to figure this out as we go along. Um, but I think prepare for that. I think the prepare for those disruptions. And I think if, if anything, just to your point about the population, we've probably stressed out a little bit too much about our personal vulnerability to this and, and the likelihood that we individually would die from it um, and probably underestimated the disruptions um, that are likely to come economically, socially, personally. Um, uh, and, and, and so now we're here. And I I think that that's just a, I think you just talk honestly, you try to listen to honest people who are telling you the truth, um, follow the right people, um, and, uh, and, you know, sort of brace for uh, the next weeks to come. But as a, I'm, a, I'm a hopeful person, uh, you know, there's another side to this. Um, you talk about we, we have who we have leading the country <laughs> yes. and, and leading these agencies. But there is a lot of bad information out yes. there. And one thing I want to ask Helen is, um, you're bombarded by people who want to give you information and want you to quote them and so forth. How do you sort through who's reliable and who's not? I probably get 10 or 12 press um, emails a day at this point and have been since early January from uh, public relations firms or <laughs> university press offices or you know, hospital press offices uh, suggesting who I should talk to. And typically, I don't talk to any of them because the people I want to talk to are too busy mm. to have their press offices <laughs> trying to line them up <laughs> interviews. Um, <laughs> Sorry, what was, the, what was your question? No, how do I figure how, it out? How do you, we are all yeah, yeah, tired. You know who, to, who to talk to, where to get your information from, and who's reliable and who's not. It's partly people you've so, known over yeah, the years. So I started after SARS, uh, the, the outbreak in 2003, when I was based in Toronto, so saw it firsthand. Um, you may remember there was a lot of concern that there might be a pandemic of bird flu, H5N1. And I did a lot of work around that. And as a consequence, I, may, I met a lot of people. I, I have a good Rolodex. They answer my emails now, which I'm profoundly grateful for because I know none of them have any time. So I, you know, I, I, I came into this armed with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of contacts and um, surprisingly Twitter. There is yeah. a very good community of infectious diseases, researchers, virologists, uh, mathematical modelers, uh, computational biologists, ev evolutionary biologists who are really trying very hard to educate the public, to dispel, uh, you know, the, the rumors that arise, for instance, you might remember, that people have been trying to suggest that this was a man-made virus and a, or a lab escape in Wuhan. Uh, people have been um, more recently there. Oh, there's it has this mutated to become an S and an L strain. One of which is more deadly, and one is which is not. You know, people take to Twitter and make rational arguments mm -hmm. in very concise ways, but it's very useful. I, you know. Twitter's not as much fun for me as it used to be because uh, <laughs> the bots and trolls are out yeah. in, in uh, huge numbers and a lot of people who want to believe the president that nothing is wrong and this is going to magically go away like to yell at me right now, but you can always block those people and go pay attention to accounts that are good. And speaking of that, Michael, yeah. um, the president said, you know, in the spring it'll go away with nicer weather and so forth. Is, is that... 
a misconception and what are some of the misconceptions out there that people should know about? It, yeah, so that particular question certainly remains an unknown about what the effect of weather will be. We know by looking across the world that this is generally spreading unabated in warmer climates. And so we have, that gives us a little bit less reason to, um, to believe that this will necessarily die down in the warmer months. But we also don't understand necessarily what does drive uh, climatic cycles of viruses like this. And uh, we, we could end up, for example, seeing that transmission doesn't go down, but, but severity of disease does because you end up having sort of uh, more humidity in your lungs and th these types of things. We're just honestly trying to understand what the pathology is um, associated with this virus and what's really leading to the severity of disease. And will a um, more warm climate actually have a large effect? We just don't know. I think in general, um, those types of comments coming from the highest office in this country are not helpful because they're not setting people up for realistic expectations. They're, they're fairy tale expectations that may or may not you know, be born out of any scientific. What, what do you think as someone who's, who's spent their career immersed in, in these subjects and studying it, what, what do you see when you see people um, giving people advice <laughs> that don't know what they're talking about? I'm not talking no. just the president, I'm talking in general. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd normally uh, outside of coronavirus um, pandemics, I normally am, am studying measles and immunological effects of vaccines and how disease transmit in that way. And, and so, of course, that, that throws me often into the lion's den of, of anti-vaccine rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult. And it's, it's sort of, I mean, it really is reminiscent of like this whack-a-mole game where you, mm -hmm. can, you can try and, and, and battle the, the uh, the incorrect and false statements that are made at, at by by anyone they might be bots they might be kids sitting on their couch just fooling around and they might be presidents of the united states and you don't <laughs> really know who it is, is that's writing anything and i try to get as much information out as i can i try to participate in social media only to the extent that i have the time to actually try to make clarifying points and um uh, what's actually been very nice to see is that there's like armies of people on Twitter who, you know, I'll publish something and you'll have anti-vaccine people or whoever give false information and say it's a Michael Min is a shill for the pharma companies and all this stuff. And you end up getting all these people who I've never met before, you know, going through the, the research line by line yeah. and trying to describe it. And so I think that helps, but certainly the, the bad information spreads much quicker mm -hmm. than the good. And mm -hmm. I don't know the solution. I think it's a very difficult problem in our world. J Juliet, I want to ask you about the structurally sp speaking, how this country is sort of organized uh, yeah. a little more. Like we had with Ebola, we had the Ebola czar. There, right. was some, there were some calls early on for the coronavirus czar, and then there was a task force set up, and now the vice president. It's not clear yeah. who's in charge, but is, is there a basic <laughs> way of a structure that you think would work the best? Well, uh, so... Welcome to our homeland uh, and, um, and uh, this great thing called the Tenth Amendment uh, sort of gives most public safety and public health authority to states. This is a locally executed threat. Um, lots of stuff going on the federal level. They're really good at giving us money. I used to be a state homeland security advisor. We love them for that. But this is going to hit each individual hospital, each individual health facility. So they're locally executed, state managed, um, and federally supported. So that should actually, so those, everyone who's focused on sort of, you know, the vice mm -hmm. president, like just, you know, maybe start watching local news. Like actually it's helpful. Like start following your local newspapers. Yes. Like not everything is MSNBC. There's a, these are local stories. Um, so that governance structure is in place. It is under, it was under stress before we got here. It will continue to be under stress. And Margaret Bordeaux, who's the uh, research director with, uh, for the program, I'm the faculty chair of on security and global health. Um, we wrote a piece about the sort of, you know, si you know side, um, the, the other consequences of this health drama. In other words, uh, people with other things will be not able to get the health services that they need. So there's gonna be all sorts of ripple effects. So this is how it's going to, um, unfold over the course of the next two to three weeks. Would I prefer federal guidance in some instances? Yes. Would I prefer, 
a strong federal communication strategy that assisted those local and state entities? Yes, I'm not gonna get them. So what do I do? You just pivot um, and you just think, okay, what's the best way to get through this, which is going to be, you're gonna see mayors rising up, which is good, governors and others at the tactical um, level. And so that's how one should be thinking about the governance structure in terms of the deployment of resources. How do we judge whether we're doing well? This is the next challenge here. Um, so we are now in the proverbial, you know, what we call the right side of the boom in crisis management. The bad thing has happened. It's coming, or it's here, sorry, it's, it's here. So we're in the sort of response phase. Our measure of success is not containment anymore. I mean, it is not, it's here. Our measure of success now is can, will fewer people die or be severe or, or get severely sick because of our efforts? Those are not just government efforts. They are private sector efforts. What are employers doing to, you know, to, to protect uh, employees, universities, uh, colleges? What is the media doing to guide us through this with um, appropriate information? That, and what are we individually doing? Are we vaccinated, right? That matters, you want a more resilient system, or do you have your flu shot? Are we more resilient than we otherwise would be? Um, uh, that, uh, you know, because of this, um, uh, what's coming. So that's how one needs to think about it, not, you know, I mean, you know, not unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> this is now gonna be, can I lower the potential for death um, so that I'm not thinking in the realm of 800,000 or give, give me any percentage and I'll give you the number, 800,000 dead, but I'm now thinking about 400,000 additionally dead from a regular flu season. Um, that's good news, I'm sorry to say it, and that's sort of the world that we're in um, Helen, right how, now. How would you respond, react? Do you see it that way or? Which way part Juliet, of that way? <laughs> the, the, 800 or 400. About <laughs> what to look for and what we should be concerned about next? Um, I, I don't really want to project numbers of deaths because I don't think I have enough information and I don't think anybody does. Um, what we should look for is what you're talking about, people working from home. Um, I, I'm very worried right now about um, vulnerable populations, it's mm -hmm. not your question, but that's yeah. what I'm gonna talk about anyway. Right. <laughs> um, I'm really concerned about, you know, people living in uh, long-term care facilities. If this virus gets into long-term care facilities, uh, it will be really bad. I'm worried about people who stay in sh homeless shelters. I'm worried about people who work in retail uh, I'm worried about people who don't have the money to stockpile food because mm -hmm. they don't have extra money. Um, you know, I'm worried about the fact that there isn't much social cohesion right now. And, you know, people seem to be really angry at each other a lot. And um, this is a time when we're really going to need to mm -hmm. help each other. Sorry. Michael, what would you say about some of these um, communities that are, are sort of neglected communities that are vulnerable? They are exactly that. They are very, very vulnerable in this in this uh, particular virus. We we know that it's it scales up to be. You know, flu has a pretty high mortality amongst the elderly, but this virus. Mm -hmm. It, it on the one hand, there's a saving grace that it doesn't seem to be impacting our young. You know, and that is. Amazing, um, yeah. and it's a very, very powerful thing about this. But uh, the mortality rate amongst reported people who are getting infected above 80 years old is 15 plus percent. That's and right. so th th I think that we, I don't think as, I don't want to sound defeatist here, mm -hmm. but I think as our, uh, uh, the, the state of our healthcare yes. system, the way that we um, have very privatized everything about it for the, <laughs> most, uh, for the most part um, is going to seriously impact our ability without, without changing almost overnight our, our, our whole, the whole way our society works. It has, it's going to limit our ability to actually um, care for these individuals. We have no ability to 
create out of the blue new hospital beds. We can't even test appropriately at this moment in time. This state that we're in has the state laboratory. They're the only ones who are currently running tests and their capacity is about 100 a day. If we can't figure out how to run some PCR instruments because we can't work together as a society, and this is at even, this is within networks, within hospitals, within the national government, everything, you know, I, I really am very concerned about this um, in a way that, uh, that it, it far exceeds our, our concerns for other viruses and other pathogens and the most vulnerable are the elderly. Helen, um, uh, Michael mentioned hospitals. How concerned are you about the preparedness of hospitals? Well, enormously. I mean, it doesn't take much to tip the system. You know, one of the reasons why uh, uh, public health is constantly, in fact, the reason why public health is constantly urging people to get flu shots every winter mm -hmm. is because when people get sick all at once, the systems can't cope. And uh, that's what's going to happen. And, you know, what Juliet was saying earlier about this being local, the, the thing about this is that everybody, you know, this won't hit every country at the same time, but everybody's trying to buy N95 respirators right now, and there aren't enough in the world, and you can't make them fast enough. So, yeah, it, it's very concerning. And... Um, you know, if healthcare workers can't stay safe and do their jobs, we have an enormous problem and it's going to be larger than it needs to be. I mean, this, this virus will, you know, cause a lot of damage, but we cause more damage if we um, deprive healthcare workers of the masks they need if they can't work safely, more people will die than would happen otherwise. Right. That's the, I mean, whatever number you pick, it's a bad number, and your only goal is to see if you can make that number less. But we're in the world in which, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a consumer, I just, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, of, of the information uh, uh, that is coming on this, but you know the idea that you, the measure of success on the other side of this is going to be whatever number you pick, it would have been higher, but for what you're doing, um, and that involves all of us. What's um, Helen? Let me ask you. You you're looking every day for, for sort of what what's the next story or the next yeah. development? What's what's what are you going to be looking for in coming days? You want me to tip the competition? Yeah, tip. <laughs> what are you working on? <laughs> um, well, some of it was in your story today when you talked about yeah, what we don't know. It, it, yeah. To be honest, it's hard right now to plan too far ahead. I start working on stories and they get overtaken by events and I have to write something that's happening spot and by the time I get back to it, that story no longer makes sense to write. That's happened a number of times. Um, I want to, if I can, spend more time on the work to develop a vaccine. I, uh, I think that's important, although it's not going to be any kind of a short-term solution. Mm -hmm. There aren't magic bullets. We're not gonna have a vaccine for quite a while. Um, I guess, I'm interested in, in sort of, according to the World Health Organization, we're still in this sort of containment phase, although I don't think that many people in the United States believe that it's containable. Um, I guess sort of trying to describe for people what the transition from containment to mitigation to mm -hmm. dealing with the reality is something I need to write about. Yeah. Let me ask Juliet and Michael, are there any lessons from um, China's handling of this? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think China, China, because it's China and our international yes. relations are always tense, um, they, they certainly received a lot of flack for their response, which was completely out of line. They have had the most... Yeah remarkable transparent. response, transparent response. They're, they 
quarantined entire cities. You know, there, there's always going to be arguments around whether it was the right thing from a, from a civil rights and a human rights perspective and things like that. But I do believe that they, they're, the length that they went to, to, spread, to, to stop the spread of this virus um, and the built, you know, they, they built whole hospitals. They have continued yeah. to build hospitals. They unfortunately purchased the whole world's worth of, of PCR instruments. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It's actually a real thing. We can't get yeah. a, we can't have PCR instruments uh, because they have been sold. But they were acting in the best interest uh, of their country and by inference the best interest of the world to try at least to contain it. Um, where, where do you, you know, come, Harvard professor, where do you come down on when hmm. you say there's civil rights and other considerations, where do you come down on what they, what I the think right thing? Absolutely the right thing. Um, they bought, they truly bought the rest yes. of the world yes. at least a month. You know, yes. the U.S. wasted it, in we my opinion. Um, but many countries did not. Africa, you got, you saw in that duration of time when they, that they bought for the world, uh, almost every country in Africa uh, was able to get a PCR instrument with an assay running. You know, it's not adequate for a continent, but we're not doing, we're, they're, they're ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think Ju it was the right move. I Juli Juliet, are there other examples where we've, turn to China for handling and sort of a, 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 a something like this in the I guess there's nothing quite like this. No, but, and, but and I mean the legal authority, I mean we're gonna we're gonna get to the moments where we're talking about legal authorities and you know emergency declarations and you know I, I you know been, it's sort of everyone's favorite scenario to, uh, you know, think about contagion and, and, you know, get to that worst case scenario. I think we um, have the capacity uh, actually through local laws and, and isolation laws um, to, uh, uh, to drive appropriate beha behavior. We're not there yet. Um, I, and so, so the China, when I think about China from the preparedness perspective, um, I think of, um, a strong communication strategy that maybe put the fear of God into everyone, but maybe was appropriate given what they were seeing. Um, and I also just think when, 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 when the story is written about U.S. preparedness for this, you know, chapter one will be called Squander Time. I mean, it will be mm. about um, not just on the medical side, but on the preparedness side, um, sort of what were we doing? I mean, as you know, and, and, and now how do we make up for lost time? So it's not just the kids. It's, it's why we seemed this week so flat-footed and surprised by things like school closings. <coughs> school closings were inevitable the second we had the first patients. I mean, and it's going to be more inevitable. I just want to end on that. Maybe if I could pick up on this story. So, so this... I'd like to say that this is a new virus, but familiar trajectory um, in terms of planning yeah. and preparedness. Um, and so, you know, all I can do is be honest, which is um, we, we, we had the sort of Eureka week, um, ending with sort of pockets of uh, behavior that seemed piecemeal, like why is Twitter headquarters doing this and not Amazon? And, and we're going to see, I think, or not just in the next 10 days, that, that sort of pocket sort of be a, a wave um, because one, there will be political pressure for it to be a wave, but also because I think the medicine and science are going to drive towards that. That also is part of the plan. I mean, in other words, this, this will be shocking to our systems, but it will be actually the right thing to do, and we've hopefully been prepared for it. So the next stories, if I were writing from the Homeland, for the Homeland Security magazine, would be, you know, sort of uh, what does that look like from a public safety perspective? Mm -hmm. Because when you, let's say you, you know, what are we thinking about essential employees um, uh, for police departments? If I'm a single mother and my kid is now home. So you have every police department in the United States now sort of thinking through you know, what's my loss of man or woman power? Um, you know, can you get National Guard to fill in the gaps? This is all happening now. We don't talk about it much. And that's good. I mean, that's what I got to get people's head around. That's what we call continuity of operations. We've gone through these processes for a reason. Um, and and now we're just sort of, you know, we're now activating them. Um, why don't we, we're ready for questions if people want to line up, but in the while you're lining up, um, I, I just want to ask Helen, you've covered, you know, as you said, SARS, Zika, Ebola, swine flu, everything. How does, how does this compare? Hmm. Um, 
I, I, hmm. I think I, I, it's, it's bizarre, but I find myself startled. And I, 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 you know, having written about the possibility of something like this for years, I still find myself really startled yeah. that it's happening. And I don't know why that is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's huge and it's exhausting and it hasn't even really taken off here yet. I mean, it is, uh, that's not true. I'm sure it has taken off here yet, but it's not yet in focus. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, I feel a bit like what I felt like in the summer of 2014 when it was uh, clear that Ebola was racing through West Africa and the world didn't have a plan mm -hmm. to stop it. And um, yeah, except that I never worried then about Ebola, you know, spreading and the city I lived in, I, it's different now. Can, can yes. I just say, before, before we get to the questions, I just want to highlight, um, it's, it's a bit what you're saying, and it's, it's the, this notion of being startled, and it's also, you know, we're in an academic center here, and I don't know, how many people are students here? Yeah. There's quite a lot of students. So, you know, the people who are on the front lines of this, of doing the mathematical modeling, yeah. developing the vaccines, develop, you know, the, our laboratories, these are PhD students, master's students, college mm. students, mm. and postdocs, you know, for the most part. These are all people, I, d I just want to, you know, it, it, it only occurred to me right now as you're saying this, that, you know, these are people who are, who are often, you know, they're coming from all over the, uh, all over the world mm. and their families, but they're, they're sitting there looking at this, at this data and trying to figure it out. And actually they're the ones creating everything that the world knows right mm. now about this virus. And I just, I just wanted to put that out there that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we have three of us here who are talking about it and some of us work directly on it and some of us less so, but, um, you know, it's really the, the, it's interesting to think about who is really creating the knowledge that we know about this. And it generally tends to be young people who, and I just want to thank like <laughs> any students who are, who, are, who are thinking about these kinds of questions. So. I mean, the shock thing is, I think, um, uh, the, uh, I have three kids. I mean, I think that this is the first uh, thing where you um, think about it as the impact, you know, one, as I can objectively, as a commentator and a faculty member, sort of talk about it this way. And yet, you know, Wednesday night, I'm replenishing my house, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and you, sh you know, people should be doing that, right? So replenishing uh, uh, stuff in my house. So, you know, you, you feel it in a way where it's both shocking, like this is the thing that, um, you know, I have no faith in, you know, I have less faith in institutions. I have real problems with the, you know, the politics going on. Um, and then I've got a family and elderly parents of which you're just thinking about it in that way. And I don't think I've thought, maybe, you know, I didn't live in New York on 9-11, but I don't think I've thought about something so sort of personally um, uh, in, in that way. Even if I feel like I'm not personally vulnerable and my kids, fortunately, as you were saying, are not in the pool. I do have living parents who I, who I have talked to more seriously than I've talked to my kids, right? Don't get on an airplane right now. Don't do this. Um, so that's, to me, the sort of shocking aspect that you just realize, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're in the pool. We're in the pool, right? Mm. Sir? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I think it changed a little bit my mind. And, <laughs> and you make me change And my please mind. identify yourself. Yeah. Uh, Ricardo Cortez from, uh, actually, from Mexico City. Okay. Uh, because uh, when I was looking at the statistics as far as the blue, how many people get the blue a year, and how many people die, really, I said, well, really, it's that, that bad. But is that because it's hitting us at the same time and it's putting a lot of stress on the medical side as far as treatment? Or is it because it's going to, uh, I guess, affect more people? I, I, I think, I think the, the major concern is it's more about the speed at which it will, and the numbers of people it will hit in a short amount of time, okay. Okay. more so than the, uh, more so than the actual viral infection itself on any given individual. And that's because it has the potential to to um, very much uh, over uh, bring our hospitals over capacity, and we're already seeing it. Um, you know, not to be 
not to scare anyone, but the emergency room at yeah. some of our local hospitals right now are, are overflowing um, because of panic, uh, people wanting yeah. to get tested. Mm -hmm. And that's already placing a huge strain on the emergency room physicians to be able to do their job, the nurses, they're trying to figure out what do we, you can't really turn somebody away from the emergency room, but what do you do when there's a lot of people who show up who don't necessarily need to be there? And um, I, these, uh, so that's really the, the concern here, I think, the biggest yeah. one. Can I make a point? You touched on it earlier. Uh, you know, seasonal flu, we all are exposed to it over the course of our lifetime. You have it multiple times. In a regular flu season, the CDC estimates that between 8 and 11 percent of people get sick with flu. The rest don't because they have some immunity from the previous year or they got a vaccine. Well, we don't have a vaccine here and all of us are, are vulnerable to this. None of us have antibodies to this. So, I mean, one of Michael's uh, colleagues, Mark Lipsitch, has estimated that between the attack rate of this, the number of people who could get infected as this sweeps across the globe, could be between 20 and 40%. That doesn't mean, you know, you have to calculate that over age groups. If kids are fine, that's great. But that's a lot of people getting sick. And that's really not something the systems can handle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I, uh, my name's Arkan Fung. I uh, teach here at the Kennedy mm -hmm. School. I've been completely consumed with how little we know because the testing is so uh, rare. And according to the Boston Globe, there's about 700 people in Massachusetts that have been kind of self-quarantined or monitored, but there's 20 tests that have been done, right? And so my question is, how is that possible in the <laughs> finest medical center in maybe the universe right here in our area? That's the first question. The second one is, what should that number be given yeah. that 700 are mm -hmm. under monitoring of some kind? How many should we have tested? Thank you. Michael? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think we should be testing in an ideal world. I mean, in a reasonable ideal world. Um, we should, at the very least, be testing tens of thousands of samples right now a day. We have the capacity as a country to, we have the theoretical capacity to do that or more, a lot more. Um, so at the very minimum, we should be, uh, we should really be getting, you know, tens or, or 20, 30, 40,000 samples could be processed every day at minimum, I think. Um, why we don't have it right now is it's a, it's a, a lot of FDA regulation which is put in place for good reasons and that's to keep to ensure quality. So especially at the beginning of an outbreak you have to be extraordinarily careful. If you, one false positive can lead, can be a very expensive and difficult thing to deal with. You have to do lots of contact tracing but one false negative can also be potentially much more devastating. So you have to make sure these tests work. That should have been done, you know, th th but these tests are very common tests. They're not, they're not rocket science. They're actually things that people in this audience uh, have performed many, many times. Uh, I'm looking at one individual here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so th these, are, these are tests that we run in our research labs all the time. So they're not, they're not difficult. So that, that I think has led to a tremendous amount of frustration amongst people who understand the tests to try to understand what happened when the test kits were first introduced and recalled. The speed at which it all happened was extraordinarily slow and I think the details of what happened will require investigative reporting later on. Um, I think there will be answers. Um, some of it are probably true errors, some of it was probably a lot of red tape and saving face. At the moment, I think we're back on the trajectory that we should have been on five weeks ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are starting to ramp up testing in Massachusetts, for example, the state laboratory, Larry Madoff and I were just testifying at the Senate the other day, and he mentioned that the state laboratory here should be up to about 1,000 tests per day in the next week or two. The hospitals in the Boston area should start getting tests online in the next three weeks or so. So it's really Thanks. slow, but at least we're starting to see testing come online. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Hi. Oh. Yes. Sorry, I have two questions. One is trivial and the and other is... Please identify yourself. My name is Marina. Um, the, and the second one is very complicated that nobody is asking. The first one is I heard that uh, your body does not create antibodies and therefore there is a huge reinfection rate for people who already had it. 
The second one is much more complex, and I hope since this is an educational institution, politically incorrect questions are allowed. Since children are not dying and young people are not dying, the only people who it's dangerous for are people in 70s and 80s or people with jeopardized immune system. Why is there such a big hoopla? And it's not just me who's asking that question. Mm. Yesterday I was sitting downstairs and my neighbor who is a graduate student who works with a CRISPR, who understands viruses much better than I do, came and asked me why is it such a big mm. deal. Today, NPR, just less than an hour ago, has asked a question that why MIT re uh, refuses to have meetings for over 150 people and called it, you know, uh, flat uh, Earth society by doing it. Hmm. Uh, so who wants to? I can, well, the, the antibody question is, yeah. um, that's Wrong. not... We, we don't know for sure how people are responding immunologically to this yet, but we do know that they're forming antibodies and they're likely protective antibodies. There's nothing special about this virus, it's just new. Yeah. And so we in fully anticipate that most people, once they recover, they will be immune, or at least partially immune. Right. There's of course been in the media um, notions that people who are getting infected, um, they, they say that they've been re-exposed and infected a second time much more likely than that is that we can often pick up the nucleic acid bits of these viruses f potentially for weeks or months right. after somebody's yeah. recovered. And so we, um, I don't, f um, from my perspective, I think that this is behaving much more like a respiratory virus that we are very commonly seeing. Mm. Yeah, I've actually seen a paper that is supposed to be going on to a preprint server shortly. It's taken a while, but uh, antibodies rise really oh. fast with this mm -hmm. virus. Um, and in terms of your claim that it's only the people who are 7 and 80 who are vulnerable, that's not true. People die, there's a teen died in China. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the details of that, but I know that they did have one teenager who died. Um, people, the, the death rate starts to climb at about 40 yeah. and it gets to be appreciable. It's like one point 70. something. And then at 50, it, it's higher. At your age, you're at risk. I, I'm at risk. It's not just old people and people with, uh, um, uh, yeah, pre-morbid right. conditions, but although as most of us age, you know, a lot of people have uh, diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, heart disease, th cancer, they may ha have things they don't know they have. The, the, the bulk Michael, of people who have died have not been in their 80s. The vast majority of the numbers of people have been in their 40s, 50s, and yeah. 60s. Mm -hmm. And, but the fraction of those who are in each age class is higher amongst the 80 year olds, but the actual vast number of people have been between 40 and, and 70. I, I got the uh, one sense from your question too that, that you might think there's an overreaction in general to, to this with canceling events, so, you know, over 150 people. So what would you say to people who think there's an overreaction? Uh, there's no right answer. Um, we don't know what the disease is likely to do, um, and we don't know whether it will change and it will hit different communities, populations of people um, differently. Uh, so, and let me, you know, and um, and you didn't do this. Your your question was fine, but. Um, mocking panic is a really weird thing to do. I mean, the American public is not, you know, is nervous. And I, I sort of joke around that, you know, if, if earthquakes have Richter scales and hurricanes have categories, people like us have the, the text scale, which is how many texts are you getting from family and friends? <laughs> I mean, it's like, and then someone was saying, well, I'll lose $7,000 if I cancel the trip to Mexico. I was like, I'm not helping you there. Like, just cancel the trip if you want to cancel the trip. But um, so people are, and I don't, and so, um, you know, the, the panic, um, is real. It, I mean, it is. And that is actually um, is a disservice to our ability to counter it. People do stupid things. They, they, they don't prepare. They get paralyzed. They, um, and so I think it's just worth um, acknowledging uh, that, uh, that um, these calls to everyone calm, everyone is freaking out, are just actually not helpful. I, I think everyone should remain calm because this is 
you know, this is the, the, the plan is unfolding as we expect. It's not a good plan, but it's, not, I mean, it's not a, uh, it's going to be bad, but it's, it's uh, expected, right? This is not like aliens coming from outer space. We actually know how a pandemic uh, will unfold. And all I can offer um, on this is, um, uh, there are no right answers right now. We do, we do, you know, with certainty. Should, why isn't Seattle closing its school district? Why is Harvard still open? Whatever. Everyone is making calculations based on the data that they can figure out. Um, and, uh, and so it's going to look different depending on where you are. And, uh, and um, just let's, you know, to your point on social cohesion, like, let's try not to be judgy. Like, so, you know, like people are going to react in different ways and the panic person um, feels that panic because they are worried about their themselves or their kids and their family. Y yes, sir. Hi. I'm Andrew Kingsbury. I'm an extension school student. I took Juliet Kayyem's Homeland Security class last semester. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> my question uh, follows up on Mr. Burke's comment regarding mass gatherings. Yeah. Uh, with states like Washington, uh, Florida that have coronavirus cases but also have primaries coming up, mm. these mass gatherings that are uh, right now inevitable, what would you give them in terms of advice? So, um, okay, so this is, a, this is the question I have. I work with a lot of public entities about uh, decisions. Okay, so I think conventions have to have a plan B um, right now. I think the Republican and Democratic conventions, and I've raised that with uh, my party um, when asked, um, we have to have plan Bs for everything. Every, uh, spring break, plan B. Olympics, plan B. Um, I cannot tell you when we're going to activate and when it's going to impact, but if the parties are not thinking about how do you have, uh, how do you pick your nominee in a different manner, um, shame on them. Um, and I've raised that, as I say, you know, I, I uh, do a lot of advice that that is known to, to, to at least one party and hopefully to both, right? So, so uh, I would, because we don't know where we will be at that moment, right? So, and I think we have to be comfortable making decisions in weak allotments. W-E-E-K, um, uh, so this coming week, I th I th I've actually, you know, I think Harvard, we think we've done a good job in sort of you, you start to ratchet as you see what's happening, you make recommendations, people be smart. Um, there may be a moment when we go online, I don't know, um, uh, for teaching. So, um, so the conventions, voting um, tends to be not a mass gathering, and I think unless people are sort of forced inside, I still think that that's uh, doable. If you are nervous and you have a mail-in state, go ahead and do that in the, in the primaries to come. But my bigger focus is the conventions. Uh, the conventions, for someone like me who does a lot of security planning around mass events, so I'm looking at the conventions and then more fun, the Olympics. Which one? March Madness. March Madness. Yep, you're looking yeah. at March. Actually, I forgot that. I was looking at yeah. the Olympics. All of that. And we have to be ready to pivot the uh, with, yeah, which one? The Hajj. The Hajj. All, well, the Hajj, I think, is not. They just closed. Yeah, I think. It, did they close it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, uh, yeah like, let's be real here. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so that's everyone get a plan B, uh, um, and including the parties. They better have a plan B. For, I don't know what the rules are for how you pick your nominee, but if it requires 20,000 people in a room, get a plan B. I'm, I'm just curious how many people here um, thought twice about even coming here. Hmm. Raise your hand. Good for Hi. you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And, and how many, um, so it, it seems like the hearty souls that came tonight are, are pretty, you're not panicking. Is that a fair thing or? Okay, okay. And can I? Can I? Yes. Yeah, the pan yeah. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think there probably are people that are panicking. Yeah. I think there are other people who are not panicking but yeah. are paying attention yeah. and they need to Good. be paying uh, attention. And, you know, there's nothing uh, unrational about putting aside extra food if yep. you can do it or figuring out what your plan is going to be if you're a single parent and you get sick and you have to have somebody take care of your child. I mean, this is all rational stuff. We should all do it yeah. anyway. We don't, but we should. And I don't think that's panic. I think that's I being smart. That's Thank you for they, that. No, no, no. Rational, I think that's exactly that I mean, voice yeah. of reason. No, it's, and, yeah. I think that's exactly. This is the plan 
is, uh, is to be ready for what we know. As I said, this is not aliens coming from Mars. Like, we know how pandemics work. We know what we should anticipate from society and, from, and, and ourselves. It's not happy times, certainly, you know, but it's, it's we have a, we are rational human beings who should act accordingly. Um, and as I said, there's no right, I mean, there's right answers in terms of getting yourself prepared, making smart decisions. This, I think, was, was touch and go. I do think that we're at a moment now where maybe uh, we don't have events like this, but um, uh, it is, I agree, it's just, people just want information, and in the, in the lack of information is where I think the right. total, you know, either the, the conspiracy theories or the, the panic um, uh, comes in. Be before there. Uh, oh, she's someone been standing at the way mic for a long time. Yep. Hi, um, my name is Lyle. I'm a junior at the college, um, and I'm certainly part of the people that are concerned, not mm -hmm. panicking, but very concerned. Yeah. Um, like I personally, like I have a condition that necessitates I take an immunosuppressant medication. So like I'm part of those like at-risk uh, groups, and like if an event were to be shut down over an abundance of caution for my sake, I would be really grateful. Um, but I'm wondering for those groups that are at higher risk, are there, is there like any sort of extra precaution that hmm. you would suggest that they take, whether they're elderly, they have a certain condition, like what are some things that they could do to better protect themselves? Michael? Yeah, so there's been, um, I think anyone who's immunosuppressed, pregnant, elderly, all of these vulnerable groups should, uh, of course, take um, heed the advice that we've been hearing everywhere and that we've been saying, uh, which is washing hands and mm -hmm. and being and having hygiene. And you know, the, this on the one hand, it sounds like just paying lip service to it, but it's actually an extraordinarily powerful way to um, to stop spread. I would also say that there's there's been um, almost out of necessity and for various reasons, there's been um, the messaging that masks do not work to prevent disease. And um, that's because, that's for, that's for a few reasons. On the one hand, we don't want everyone who, um, we want to prioritize masks at a public health level to people who are tr potentially transmitters of the virus and not those who are trying to protect themselves. We're also concerned that improper use of a mask uh, can give a false sense of security and, and ultimately cause people to behave in a way that they wouldn't necessarily if they weren't wearing it. Um, that said, for somebody who, um, uh, f for somebody with pre-existing conditions or with it, who is immunosuppressed, I do think you know if there's serious concern and you you know that you or a loved one is is immunosuppressed, then then I I don't recommend everyone goes out and purchases them, but masks do actually work, and I think public health messaging will yell at me for saying that, but they do work. We know that they work. We give them to doc doctors and nurses because we want to decrease risk. We just don't want everyone to go and buy them because we absolutely need them to remain available to prevent the onward spread. Um, but that is if, if you have to get in a, a plane, if you're from Milan and you have to go home tomorrow or something, you know, wearing a mask is probably not a bad idea. And I, I, it's not the end all be all, but there's, um, you know, the, the other option, I mean, the other pieces are certainly just awareness, awareness of what you're touching, awareness of mm -hmm. how you're touching your face. Um, I was on a meeting the other day with 12 uh, researchers from the Harvard uh, MIT campuses talking about how we're going to deal with this virus. And I have a screenshot of it. And every single one of us was touching our face during one moment of it. And so um, I was just looking you know, at you like this. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. so it's really it's very difficult. Um, but you know, those, those measures actually go a really long way. And the more we learn about this virus, we're learning that, yes, it's transmitted through droplets, but it's likely very, it's likely has very high transmission through surfaces. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's at least something that we can track on our own. And so that's, you know, it's, it's, not, the, it's not a great answer, I know, and, and there's no silver bullet here, but it's, uh, it's an answer. The... Um It'd be great to end on a sort of upbeat note. And, <laughs> uh, um, the, the only thing I can think of to do that is to um, see if there, if anyone could give a shout. I mean, um, Michael mentioned some of the, the young researchers and yeah. the, what's going on on the campuses. But is there any shout out to be given for 
anyone who's shown leadership or anyone that you three have been particularly impressed with in, in their reaction and how they've handled it or what their role is in this? <laughs> so easy to see the bad things. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is, um, you know, I think the FDA and the CDC got a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, disparaging remarks um, about testing kits. Um, and I think, warranted or not, we are, we are moving ahead. Yes. And some of the regulations that the FDA has been making in the, in the recent days, I mean hours, have, have they're, they're making, for, from, from an FDA regulatory perspective, the concessions that they're making are fairly extraordinary to try to promote increased testing. And I think that they are acting in a cohesive manner um, and in the best interest of the US and sort of saying, we know that we have all this red tape, we know we have to abide by this, but we're the FDA and you know what, if this is best for the United States, we're gonna just do away with those rules for now. And we're seeing a lot of that and, and I think it's going to open up testing capacity yeah. and I think they've come a long way. I'd say every person who has rationally prepared their home or stayed home because they had a bit of a fever and, um, and just contributed to the, to the uh, uh, to our social resiliency as we move forward. I, you know, we, there's very opportunities that any of us get to actually be heroes and standouts, and this is, this is it, this is the moment. So um, to those people, I applaud um, and hope all, everyone uh, does the same. Um, I would go back to uh, some people I mentioned earlier on. Um, a lot of, uh, virologists I follow, infectious disease uh, specialists that I follow, the evolutionary biologists I follow on Twitter. You know, these are people who are extraordinarily busy right now mm -hmm. trying to crunch data or prepare hospitals or whatever, and yet they are taking time to do public messaging, yeah. to, to communicate facts and good information to the public in the amount that they can. I'm always floored when I see them on Twitter because I think, wow, you know, this is probably a choice between sleep and this and mm -hmm. you, you're doing this. Um, you know, somebody I, I've interviewed a few times at the University of Wisconsin said he did a public meeting for his kids' school. Parents were really concerned and so he knows a lot about virology and he went to explain what's known about the virus. I, I, that stuff inspires me. I find yeah. that really, it's very useful. I find it, you know, it's a way for me to get information at a time when it can be very hard to reach people, but it's also information that is available to a lot of other people. And I, you know, I really am grateful for the people who take that time because they don't have it to spare. Well, I think we're going to have to end there. You can ask your question to them directly afterwards. Um, thank you for an illuminating discussion. I hope you'll all follow the three of them on Twitter to continue the conversation. <laughs> thank and, you. And Michael will certainly be there telling people when they're going over the top and they're not <laughs> correcting them their, and their advice. And I want to thank all of you for, for making the trip. And I, th I think this is a very valuable yes. discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.